doing. <laughs> Welcome to worship with the Universalist Unitarian Church in Peoria. My name is Reverend Jennifer Ittis. It is my great joy to be the minister of this congregation along with the members and friends, children and youth of all ages. We are so glad that everybody is gathered with us this morning in all the ways that we are, in person and online. Hello, Zoom. Hello. Oh, hello, Facebook as well. Yes. We are a community, intentional in gathering in joy, sharing and comfort, and also recognizing life's challenges. We gather around our shared promise to support each other's spiritual journeys. So let us worship together all gender identities, sexual orientations, politics, races, cultures. May we root ourselves in this values of this faith, compassion and courage, transcendence, justice, transformation, and service. And I very much want to welcome those who are our guests this morning who are new to the congregation in whatever way, whether you're online or in person, hello. Thank you for taking a chance and taking the time to come through our doors and join us in worship. As we are rooted in our relationships, uh, we recognize our connections with our neighbors and this land. This is the ancestral home of the Peoria people. I'm sure we'll figure this out. There's always a technical conversation. We are in this brave new world, are we not? It's fine. Okay. Because the ancestral home of the Peoria people never had to deal with electronics before. So we recognize how much has changed. But what's also still true is that the Peoria people recognized and welcomed the first European settlers as they came down the Illinois River. We recognize the Peoria people for who they were in the past and for who they are today. And speaking of how we are together, I want to offer a profound encouragement to wear name tags. Please, whether you think you have yours, the plastic ones or the temporary ones, Please be gracious and kind and compassionate to the minister who's had pandemic brain for, you know, going on over the two years, right? But also to each other so that we may help each other introduce ourselves, get to know one another, and so on. Help us be good hosts to each other. I want to invite you to put uh, devices into worship mode. And also want to offer a note, you'll see that we're varied in our masking practice at this point. We've moved from universal masking to recommended, and this is in deference to knowing that every one of us may have health concerns or family or commitment concerns that we don't know. Uh, and we want to recognize that masking can be helpful uh, in whatever our context. All right. Today... Today, we got lots of good stuff happening in the service and also after the service. We are celebrating our excellent pianist, Rosa Chang, today in Fellowship Hall after the service. This is Rosa's final Sunday with us before her family moves to Taiwan. Like this week, they're moving to Taiwan, like this week. I'm still kind of like, how did that happen? But 
So there will be cake. Come for cake. There's also cards to fill out so you can offer Rosa some best wishes as well. And we may take a moment to thank her it after, uh, during coffee hour. Also, uh, after the service, in case you were wondering why we are abundantly uh, furnished this, uh, this morning, this is the last, kind of the end of the rummage sale. Um, and Lindy Peterson, did you, is Lindy, you want to take a minute? Come on up. We're no rush. I will offer my note of thanks to everybody who contributed, everybody who was here. Lindy scooting down the aisle is dangerous. <laughs> All right, Lindy, if you would say something, please. It's faster going down than it's going up. <laughs> yeah, so everything that's here is because we just got done with our rummage sale. We've had a huge number of people who helped with that. Thank you, thank you. In particular, I want to thank Judith Shanahan, who did so much. I want to thank Shirley Cunningham for having her own rummage sale that benefited our sale. And I also want to make sure to thank Nancy Taylor, who gave me the complete playbook on how to do this. Uh, and she has done the rummage sale for so many years that we have a reputation in the community of being a good sale. So that's because of Nancy. Um, <clears throat> And thank you to everyone who wants to stay and help us clean up after. Um, after Rose's thing, we will be having cleanup. And after that, it's out to Mexican and margaritas. So there is, there is an incentive. Um, just to let you guys know, we had two days of sale. Um, and from that and from Shirley's pre-sale sale, we made right around $9,000. So thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, take your time. Let's see. I know Lindy needs all hands to help with the packing. And, and if you'd like to join me in, um, after we recognize Rosa, if you'd like to join me in the library, we're going to be resuming our discussion group. Uh, that's also a moment to participate as well. We'll be answering a big question. I have a big question we all get to tell a story about for the discussion group. And speaking of questions, today's service is the question box sermon. Entitled for this year, the question is the answer. And this is a service where we all get to help create it together. So you may have gotten uh, a slip of paper in the order of service as you came in, or if you're online, uh, you're also welcome to submit a question in, on Facebook or on the uh, Zoom chat. And we'll be collecting all of those questions when we receive the offering in a little bit. And those questions are what I will be responding to. Is what, are, what would you like me to address during the sermon time today? I will do my best to address as many questions as possible, and then I get to keep them and help them. They will help inform me about what we might answer for worship this year. So it's not just for today. It might be helping the entire year. So I want to encourage you to ask a question, write it down very legibly, because I'll be reading these very quickly, um, and then I'll be, have the chance to respond to them during the service. So thank you very much. We have the question box today. And one last note about logistics, that today is a service. Uh, we don't have a formal children's program today. Children are welcome to remain in the service uh, and uh, remain through the service, in fact. But if you'd like to leave, uh, we have child care. Uh, we do have a story, so perhaps you're welcome to leave after the story if you so wish. And if you'd like to know more about our education program, I think we have Jesse Lachlan, our excellent director of Lifespan Religious Education here today. And we have a wonderful lineup for the fall. All right. And now let us enter into worship. Would you join me in singing our opening hymn, number 126, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Please rise in body or spirit.
Please be seated. I'd like to welcome Mary Mahalan Kafar to offer our opening words today. Our opening words are by the Reverend Burton Carley. We gather this Sabbath morn to worship in spirit and truth, to raise a joyful noise of eternal mystery, to reconfirm our covenant, to seek the wisdom and love, to strengthen our commitment to the common good. We come from many paths, that which is hidden, to consider the ways to our hearts, to confess how we have stumbled, to heal what is broken. We assemble in effort to quicken our compassion and mercy, to deepen our understanding, to renew our courage to remember who we are. Thus do we celebrate the grace and the gift of life and to practice our faith to the greater glory of the Spirit. Blessed be. Mary, would you light the chalice while I do the words? Yeah. Great. Our chalice lighting comes from the Reverend Julianne Lepp. We seek our place in the world and the answers to our heart's deep questions. And as we seek, may our hearts be open to unexpected answers. May the light of our chalice remind us that this is a community of warmth, of wisdom, and of welcoming multiple truths. In this spirit, we light our chalice as we offer our service. Thank you. Please rise in body or spirit and join me in singing our hymn number 389, Gathered Here. We will sing it through three times. Please be seated. Our story today is from my colleague and friend, the Reverend Barbara Gaydon, and it is her take on the Emperor's New Clothes. And I'll give you a hint, I'm going to need your help to, to make up the ending. So once there was an emperor who needed a new set of clothes to wear in a grand parade, and he called two of his finest cloth weavers to order one. And they looked at him, they looked at each other, and decided this might make be a chance to make a little extra on the side. Oh, emperor, they said, we have invented the most marvelous cloth. It'll cost you a little, you know, extra. But it is magic. It's so magic that people cannot see it if they are lazy or not good at their job. So not only will your majesty look your absolute royal best, but you will be able to tell immediately who you should fire. And the emperor thought, hmm, I've been wondering who those people are. I'll take it. All right. So off the weavers went to work and... Oh, they were slow. They were slow. The emperor sent one of his wisest advisors to check on their progress. And when he got there, 
he saw the two of these weavers doing, well, nothing. It looked like they were waving their hands back and forth in front of the loom, but there was no cloth coming out. But, you know, the advisor didn't want the emperor to think that they were dumb or, or lazy or not good at their job. So, so the advisor rushed back to the emperor and sang praises. It's awesome. You'll love it. Well, this went on a couple of times. But, but finally the day arrived and the weavers brought the suit to the emperor to try on because, of course, it would fit the first time. It's that perfect. And, and the weavers brought it out and shook it out in front of the emperor and said, oh, isn't it spectacular? And the emperor, feeling a little self-conscious, didn't want to be seen as, you know, not good at his job. Well, felt a little anxiety inside. This is one of the inside the head voices. And thought, oh, am I one of those people who is lazy, is not good at their job? So he couldn't say that, but he could say, please help me. So he asked the weavers to help him put it on. He felt a little... Um, Embarrassed in the mirror because it looked like he was wearing nothing. But the weavers pulled here and creased there, and then they oohed and awed and admired about how wonderful it looked. And well, then it was time for the parade, so there was no more time. So the emperor may, was prepared for the big entrance. Much would be revealed. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So everyone cheered loudly for the acrobats and the dancers and the horses. I mean, this was an event. And then, and then there was the emperor, completely unclothed. And everyone got really quiet. And then, and someone said, huzzah for the emperor, because they didn't want to think that people... They weren't good at their jobs. And another person said, oh, look, a new man. Dang. But one child, one child gazed upon this spectacle and said, oh, he's not wearing any clothes. The parade stopped at that point. I think that we should create an ending to this story. I've asked you for questions, but here's my question to you. What do you think happened after the child asked, said that and the parade stopped? What do you think happened? What do you think? Yes. The emperor laughed. I like it. All right. The emperor laughed. What do you think happened, Dave? The emperor said, oh my. Uh, oh my. <laughs> oh my God. Mm -hmm. What do you think happened? Yes. Hmm? I'm sorry, go ahead. The emperor ran inside. Yeah, I think that might be my first impulse. Yes. I'm sorry. He cried. You know, I could see that. Yeah. Yes, Judy. You think the little child became Liz Cheney? There, you know, I'm just saying, we interpret our lives as they are, do we not? All right. Well, keep thinking. Keep thinking. Thank you so much. And now I would like to thank you very much for helping me with the story. Because, well, you just don't know what's going to happen when you tell the truth. And that's why it's a brave thing to do. And that's why we can, we should do so whenever possible and maybe get a few friends around to say, yes, we can tell the truth together. And how important it is to speak up. So I want to invite Dave Grebner forward to offer our words for offering.
Unitarian Universalist minister Heather Christensen has written that Unitarian Universalism is a grand vision of a world filled with peace and justice, love and joy. That vision is embodied in a few large congregations, numerous mid-sized congregations, and many, many small congregations. No matter its size, every congregation depends on each of its members. Each one of you, by your commitment of time, energy, and resources, helps make that grand vision real. Individually and together, we are universe, Unitarian Universalists, building a world filled with peace and justice, love and joy. Now we'll receive our morning offering, and as Rosa plays, we'll pass the plates. Um, and after the plates have been collected, you are welcome to come forward and light candles of care. Um, and as the plates are going around, this is also the moment, if you've managed to do so, this is also the moment uh, to put the, the little paper that has your question or questions on it. Okay? I'll give a second round of collection if you aren't quite done if, as the sermon begins. But this is also the moment to put all the little pieces of paper in, you know, the, the money ones and the question ones. All of them go together today. And now let us receive, now let's have the plates come forward.
we gather in all the seasons, all of the chapters, all of the days and moments of our lives. And we do so in the service, in worship, as we make an effort to create a larger circle of care, recognizing that there are joys and sorrows and memories, things that are with us that need to be shared if they are to be born. And there are, to, there are joys and wonders and celebrations that cannot help but come forth from us and must be glorified and amplified and held by all of us to bring more joy and wonder in the world. In the spirit, we gather for our sharing of joys and sorrows. And I want to begin with uh, a sorrow of a loss from Phyllis Close for the passing of her friend Nerio Calgaro on August 5th. We offer our care and sympathy to Phyllis to, and all of Nerio's family and friends for, in, in recognizing their death. We also offer our deepest sympathy to the family and friends who mourn the loss of our fellow Unitarian Universalist, Jack Schlicksup. He died at the age of 76, peacefully in his home, last Sunday, August 14th. His memorial, uh, created by, uh, put together with his family, was yesterday, August 20th, at Wright and Salmon Mortuary, the family was very happy to see members of this congregation. Some of us were able to attend the service. And I want to thank everybody who sent memories and stories to me so that I could speak about Jack, offer a few notes on his life yesterday. I want to offer a note of sympathy to those family and friends who mourn the loss of another Unitarian Universalist, Linda Lyman Wyman. Her first memorial was at the UU Congregation in Santa Fe yesterday. Uh, many of us were able to tune in on YouTube to watch it as it was live streamed. And we will host our own memorial for Linda's life uh, here in Peoria on August 20, uh, excuse me, October, <laughs> October 22nd, uh, which will coincide with her and Dave Wyman's uh, wedding anniversary. So stay tuned for more about that service as well. And we turn to our care and concern. We offer uh, support to Nancy Venzen as she experiences health, health challenges and prepares for surgery on September 21st. We also offering, offer healing wishes to Joyce Herent as she recovers from surgery that she had on August 12th. And now we turn to our good wishes. We offer our good wishes to Shirley Cunningham as she settles into new surroundings at Proctor Place. And let me add an additional note of thanks to everybody who helped with the estate sale at her, um, at her previous home uh, last weekend. It really made an enormous difference in helping with her transition. And let's see. I also want to offer... Uh, congratulations, I like this one, congratulations to Sarah Short and Justin McAlexander, uh, who eloped in Vegas, right? They eloped in Las Vegas earlier this year and got married at the Little White Wedding Chapel in Elvis's Pink Cadillac. Now that's a joy. We offer our congratulations to some of our wonderful artists. Uh, Terry Malone won first place in uh, watercolor in the Illinois Art League show. Uh, let's see. So Terry Malone won first place in the watercolor category. Sandy Meskimen won an honorable mention in watercolor. And to Judith Corin Shanahan, who won an honorable mention in the 3D category. Uh, so congratulations to all of our excellent artists. And now, I want to offer a moment of reflection 
uh, of space, of quiet, for there are certainly, as we've just heard from the, the many different kinds of joys and sorrows and support and care that we've just heard, that there are so many more that live in our hearts and remain unspoken. So let me offer another moment where we can hold what is with us in the quiet. Uh, let it be represented in the candles, whether you lit one or not, the candles are for all of us. Let us hold one more moment of quiet together, knowing that we are with and are part of our circle of care that is ever expanding, that has room for us all. Let us share one more moment of quiet in silence. Amen and Namaste. Please rise in body or spirit for our hymn number 34, Though I May Speak with Bravest Fire. Please be seated. So this particular morning is a message that we create together. And I have any number of questions from you. I have the stack. And if there are additional questions, you're welcome. If you hadn't quite gotten yours composed and written, you're welcome to come on up and kind of slip it to me on the side here. We'll see where it falls in the selection. 
And I will answer them to the best of my ability in the time available. And any questions not addressed directly in this moment will help inform our worship for the coming year. And perhaps they will inform uh, what happens in the life of the congregation as well. So in case you haven't been around the question box sermon before, you may wonder, why? Why is Reverend Jennifer looking to us for our questions? Doesn't she have plenty of things to talk about all by herself? Or is this her way of getting out of writing a sermon? I mean, you know, that's a fair question. So let me address the second question first. Um, plenty of things, absolutely. We have only just begun to explore the larger message of progressive religion in this time and in this place, in this moment in our human history. And to answer the third question, I will tell you, in case you've ever like been wondering, been a public speaker or done this, to show up and answer the kinds of questions that you may offer with almost no time to think about them in uh, really does not let me off the hook. Let's put it that way. Um, and, and I want to add to that that we do this, that I do this in the context of worship um, and need to remain so in the context of the service on Sunday. Uh, whatever is asked, believe me, this is, this is both fun. For me, this is fun. And it's also serious business. It is both. So let me offer a note about why many, many Unitarian Universalist ministers will do some form of the question box sermon. Our congregations choose who will preach and who will lead the services. And once chosen, the minister, the guest who's, you know, the, or the guest who's been invited into the pulpit, the minister may say, they speak the truth in love as they see it. Uh, this liberty is part of our free pulpit tradition. And at the same time, part of the trust placed in the preaching minister is that we speak to the lives of the congregation and to the larger world and our larger faith of which we are a part. And to do this, the speaking too, without ever asking what are your concerns, what are your big questions, keeps the minister from wonderful sources of inspiration and information. And for me, it's really part of living out the covenant that we have shared. It's about living out our mutual promises that that we are together, that I will hear you and you will hear me and we will create this, this congregational life in this moment. So, we'll see, we'll see where we go on this particular Sunday because every question box sermon is a little bit different. Let's see. So we have, so while I am laying out the questions in the moment, when I've done this with my spouse, the Reverend Patrick Price, because when our previous ministry, we were co-ministers and we would do the question box sermon together. Um, that was enormously fun because we each have different experiences and different styles. Um, one of us would be over here kind of sorting the questions and the other one would be over here at the pulpit. And then we'd take turns. But one of the ones I want to offer, uh, volunteer a little bit, uh, first is because there was already a question this morning, um, was about my stole. I'm going to step out here. So new stole, this is the premiere of this stole. Uh, for those of you who don't, aren't familiar with kind of liturgical garb, this stole uh, represents a commitment of service, a commitment of, a commitment of service in ministry. Um, it goes back in some ways as far back as uh, the cloth that Jesus would have held put around his neck when he washed the feet of the disciples. It's one of the most powerful images of this. But the soul largely represents that I am ordained and I am committed to being in the service of Unitarian Universalist ministry and with this congregation in particular. And I will offer a little bit about this one because if you are at all a fan of Doctor Who, this excellent long-running British sci-fi series, 
that this might resemble a certain scarf from a certain doctor, the fourth doctor in the Doctor Who show. So I thought this was a really good one for the question box sermon. Doctor Who? Who? But um, ching. So, which kind of fits with what I'll take for the first uh, for the first question that I received from Phyllis Close. Uh, why did you become a minister? Why did you become a minister? Was it earth shaking or was it a gentle process? And I'll offer the note that you know I get to be the minister, so I get to what, choose kind of fun stuff like this. That's my side benefit. But why did I become a minister? Well, I grew up in Unitarian Universalism in Massachusetts, um, third generation, and was really around the church my entire life in one way, shape, or form. Grew up in the congregation of Worcester, Massachusetts, uh, that was known for being more humanist, uh, but it was historically universalist, had the same historic roots as this congregation, and was involved with youth programs and so on. And when I got to college, when I got to college, I was doing a theater degree, not an acting one, not a performance one, but a technical one, and of uh, stage management and lighting design. But I also knew that I wasn't going to make money in theater. My mother was kind of relieved when I like figured that one out, or at least from her perspective, from her perspective. I knew that wasn't my vocation, let's put it that way. So I sat down trying to avoid calculus one night in December with way too much caffeine. And I was like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do after college? What am I going to do with my life? And realized that in all that I had been taught, all that I had learned and all that I had done, that I needed to be of service. That I needed to be doing more that I could live my values out into the world. And to do so in creating the kind of community experience that I had been in church and in youth group in so many ways, that's what I had to do. And it was very much that existential, duh, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go into ministry. I even interrupted my friend who I was studying with and said, I know what I'm going to do with my life. And he's like, that's great. <laughs> Can we get back to calculus? <laughs> so it was both made all the sense in the world and was a wow. And then I went from there. Let's see. Let me do one I want to make sure to cover in the moment. Speaking of how do we create the community together, one of those ways that we create community together is to have fun. One of the conversations we've had with leadership and with the staff and so on in the last few weeks has been, how do we have more fun? We want some more fun, yes? Do we need more fun? Yes? Do I get a yes? Yes, 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 yes. Absolutely, amen, yes. So... One of the things we were going to do that is fun is that we will, on September 11th, which will be our in-gathering water communion service, that that will be a chance, one, for, for the gathering in is the official start of our church year. We want to have everybody come on in, back into the congregation, whether in person or whether online. And after the service, that we will have a potluck. <gasps> no food. Yay. Yay! There we go. Yes, the potluck is not just saved for the picnic anymore. So we will have potluck. I want to invite folks to bring in some good stuff to eat. And we will have kind of a splish splash kind of day. There will be water activities. So if you have children or youth, have them bring a spare set of clothes, maybe even bring a spare set of clothes yourself because, you know, water happens. Water happens. So we will have some fun in that way. We are talking about when to have the October trunk or treat for Halloween. We are talking about all kinds of things for fun. 
So I want to invite you to stay tuned to the newsletter and announcements to see what happens. Jesse, were there are the other fun things that I have forgotten just before? Oh, oh, game night. We're going to have game nights, the return of game nights. Yes. And other things. Yep. Yep. Very good. I really want to appreciate, uh, say thank you to the Religious Education Committee for thinking about the fun as well. Huh. I have a question from uh, that came up online before the service, and I think it's one that I really want to make sure to, to address in this moment, which is, does the church or any church or religion for that matter have any response to the rise of political extremism and demagoguery that, occur, that is occurring in this country? Do we have a response to the extremism and demagoguery occurring in this country? And is there anything as we, anything we either as individuals or a parish can do to help counteract this trend in a positive manner without adding unnecessary, unnecessary fuel to the fire? So what can we do individually and as a congregation? And I would say as a faith as well. And to do so in a way that would be constructive. I gotta take a sip before this one. This is big. All right. So my first answer to this is that simply by existing and doing what we do, we already are countercultural in that way. We are already saying that love and compassion and justice and including people and care and being community-minded, these are already things that we are living and promoting and living into again and again and again. Simply by doing what we do, we are annoying to those folks. That's right. Let's keep on being annoying. Simply by saying, we are going to read all the books not the ones you think shouldn't be shown because you think they portray ways of life or understandings of people that, that you don't somehow want to protect precious children from. Simply by saying people should have access to the bathrooms that they need to have, no matter who they are, that is countercultural. That is important, for example among many. As individuals, I think any time that we can show up and speak the truth and say, you know, this is not how, this is not the story of the world of the society that I'm a part of. Any time we can do that individually, we have power to do so. And we can reach out to each other along the way. So when somebody, so if there's a conversation about, I'll give an example. Um, if there's a conversation about that includes kind of racially profiling people, stereotyping people who are black or uh, brown or yellow or so on. And you say, you know, that's not the world that I'm a part of. And simply be able to say, I'm not going to participate in this conversation. That by itself is something powerful to do. This is not how I participate in a conversation when folks get ugly and try to say, try to offer versions of the world that you're like, this is not true. And I think as a congregation, what we will be called to do, uh, we're going to start to do a couple of things. One, we have you, you, the vote. If we haven't learned that voting matters, 
I don't know when we're going to learn it, frankly, but we need to do it. We need to keep on to preserving the democratic process. So we'll have more conversations about UU the Vote, uh, which is our kind of denominational uh, action about uh, supporting uh, voting rights, voting efforts, and justice, and access, and enfranchisement. Uh, we will also, I think, starting at least in, I think, September, if not next week, uh, the social impact team approved uh, returning to share the plate. Uh, so that means when we receive the offering, we will be uh, an, the undesignated offering, the loose cash, if you will, will be split with the congregation and with a uh, destination of our choosing. The first destination, the first recipient, will be the New Mexico Coalition for Reproductive Choice. Um, and that is because they are working with the Texas Coalition for Reproductive Choice so that they may fly people who need abortions from Texas to New Mexico so they can have the health care they need. That is a powerful thing by itself. So we'll be starting to learn, starting that share of the plate, uh, beginning with that organization. And as you might imagine, this is not the end of the conversation, but that's just a start. Aha, uh -huh, we might have a question that's coming in electronically. This is fancy. No questions yet. Okay, fine. <laughs> I got plenty, I got plenty. Let's see what time is it. Ah, we want to, let's see. So we have a question about why do I use the word worship? We do not pray to God. Some of us do, some of us don't. Um, whether with a capital G or a little g. How do you describe the word worship without uh, worshipped or adored? Um, whom are we worshipping? So, uh, what the meaning of worship is, is to be setting aside a time where we encounter that which uh, is of most importance to us, that which is of worth. It's kind of that simple, but it's also as complicated and deep and complex as we make it. That we gather in the service in this moment, we set aside time. This is like no other hour in our lives where we get to consider more thoroughly, more deeply, what it is that matters to us, what are we concerned about, and what are our fears, and that we do it together, knowing that we can't possibly entertain all of our questions and concerns alone, that we are more powerful when we do gather together, and that we bring out more perspectives on what's important to us than any one of us can offer alone. We come here so that we can create diversity of thought and exploration and wondering, as well as more depth and more insight. And we do that regularly on Sundays again and again and again. Let me tell you, as someone who plans worship, Sundays aren't relentless. They happen every week, funny thing. But I tell you, every week there's no less, there's no, there's no less to say. There's no less to encounter. Because as we just heard from the previous question, there is so much that we wrestle with now. So our worship is, we have the service that is in support of our worship, which is the gathering together and the recognizing of what is deepest and most held and what we're concerned about and what we want to offer, what is our vision into the world. And that can be with God. That might not be with God. As I say, you know, when I, I have to see kind of when the, by, by the time I put the service together, whether or not um, God shows up. Sometimes, sometimes God does, sometimes not. I mean, you all, most of you have heard me preach. Sometimes God, sometimes not. But part of what's wonderful about Unitarian Universalist uh, congregation in this moment is that we are a place where we have the big tent of theology, 
where we can talk about God or we can talk about not God. We can talk about what is it that, uh, what is it, what are our, how will we figure out our place and power and development in the universe? And we can have the greatest expansiveness of language to do so. So if there's more, so sometimes you're like, I, I am not about the God. You know, I'm thoroughly atheist and hallelujah, well, so to speak. Because we all need one another in the conversation. Wherever our theological language takes us, we need one another. That's why in our seven principles, you're not necessarily seeing any one particular God. You have to come at that from your theological, from where you come from theologically to say we believe in the inherent worth and dignity of every person. That's not attached to any one understanding of God, for example. So. Let's see. And let me start to wrap this up. Um, I, I appreciate this. Is there, this one's a little bit shorter, but it's also a little longer. I will keep it short. Is there a name for a person who is searching a spiritual direction? A searcher? Someone who seeks? A seeker? Um, that's a singular name. Um, and, and I kind of, I, to me, it kind of goes together with the other question. Um, why do we call ourselves Unitarian Universalists? Well, because this congregation comes from our tradition of the Universalist Church of America um, and the American Unitarian Association and came together. The, you know, this congregation was founded in 1843 as a Universalist congregation, one where in the Christian language at the time was concerned that to let people know that we do not believe in eternal damnation. That by itself is radical. That you are not going to be condemned for eternity because of whatever you do in this life. Because we believe in a loving, inclusive, and welcoming power in the universe. At that time, they talked about God and Jesus. That's evolved a lot in the last, you know, not quite 200 years, as it should. And we have that line of theology and commitment to a free church, to members, to congregations who choose who are the, how to define members and who choose who their educators and ministers are. We are part of that tradition that keeps creating and co-creating the religious experience together because we know as an institution that we are uniquely situated to recognize the, all the ages of our lives, all the stages of our lives, and that we are all in this together. And we do so in Unitarian Universalism because it, for so many of us, it offers a place of liberation, a place of healing from a difficult religious path, a place of practice and focus if you didn't have a, a particular religious origin. It offers a chance of service, whether it's with the congregation or out in the world. So we are within the Unitarian Universalist tradition, not just as an independent congregation, but as a much larger, current, larger history that's over 2,000 years old as well. And so we get thoroughly grounded in the tradition and the experience, as well as being open to new truth, and to do so in the big tent that is Unitarian Universalism. All right. I will need to wrap this up at this point. And there's like more big questions. I love the big questions. So stay tuned. I'm going to give you a preview of the big questions, which is, how can people say God is loving when so much horrible stuff happens? Right? Or why does God allow suffering? We'll be looking at that. The one I really, I haven't quite gotten this question before, but what is the source of love? What is the source of love? 
How about that one? And we might need to have another conversation just about that one. What's the source of love? And the other question uh, that we'll be working on this year, I want to offer as part of my priorities, um, Black Lives Matter isn't in the headlines anymore. Will Unitarian Universalism still work toward racial justice? Yes. Stay tuned. Yes. Because this is part and part, whether or not something is in the headlines, uh, a particular name or so on, we still need to be working towards a more multicultural, anti-oppressive, anti-racist life, society, not just our congregation, although we start here, but in general. So yes, we will still be supporting and abiding by the efforts that started in, uh, that inspired us to bring the sign Black Lives Matter. Our larger faith is also working on um, uh, more um, reflection around racial justice and oppression. And we're going to be part of that conversation as well. So. So what I want to offer in closing is a note of thanks. As you can see that the questions that we share, these kinds of questions are the ones that come up year after year after year. They are always with us. And so we will always have opportunities to address them together and to address them in worship, to address them in reflection and classes and so on. Because we, we are in fact part of the co-creation of this congregation. We are essential to it in all of our lives. And we are, and in this moment of kind of co-creating this beloved community, we are, get to be this microcosm of how do we want to create and be helping to serve and help heal the world as well. We're never going to complete that task, just so you know but we can be part of it in all the ways that we can. And I look forward to where we shall go for this year together. Now, I want to move to our closing hymn. Uh, it's Come Sing a Song with Me, number 346, by Carolyn McDade. And part of why we, I like this hymn in particular, but we're closing with this hymn uh, in honor of Linda Lyman Wyman, our lovely deceased member who we're recognizing, uh, because this hymn was one of her requests for her memorial. And we're going to be asked to sing this hymn at her memorial with us on October 22nd. So let's practice now. Please rise and body your spirit for our closing hymn, number 346, Come Sing a Song With Me.
We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. And I will offer as I uh, begin the benediction that I want to invite you to remain seated for our postal because this is it with Rosa. So let us enjoy, let us enjoy our, the last music we get to hear from her live from Peoria. All right. 